We're taking coffee breaks to continue to be fully caffeinated. Um, good morning, everybody, so, and uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, so as Joanne said, I'm the Director of Academic Technology at the Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences. If you're not sort of familiar with how Harvard is structured, we actually have 11 different schools at Harvard. The Faculty of Arts and Sciences is the undergraduate and graduate program. So collectively, we're about half of Harvard. So I represent sort of those folks, but not necessarily the professional schools. So I don't work directly with law, medicine, business, education, although we do collaborate with them a great deal. So um, just so you know that I'm mostly talking about sort of our undergraduate programs, and then I'll be speaking about Harvard X. So today I'm going to go over a bit about sort of what I'm talking about when I say educational technology, because I realize most of you are not educational technologists. And then I want to talk about how we approach innovation in terms of teaching and learning and research with technology at Harvard. And I'm going to talk about three current initiatives that we have. One is a brand new sort of core curriculum called the FAS General Education Program. A second is our new um, Harvard Initiative on Learning and Teaching. And then I'll be talking about sort of our, our new partnership with edX and how we have created a Harvard X organization to encourage sort of open sharing of knowledge. So first off, just to make sure everyone has a, a clear picture of, so what I'm talking about when I talk about uh, you know, educational technology. It's a very wide-ranging, you know, Venn diagram-y kind of field. It overlaps with many different disciplines, and it's, it can be a very wide-ranging you know, definition of what it is. But basically, in its um, short form, it's really using tools of any kind to support teaching and learning. And I think my faculty are often kind of relieved to hear that you know, I will consider anything from a chalkboard to you know, an overhead projector to a computer simulation to a walk-through 3D model as being educational technology. So I don't try to force them into using something just because it's whiz bang or it's fancy or something like that. Educational technology is really any tool that can be used to support teaching and learning. And you know, it can also refer to you know, videos, it can refer to things related to audiovisual technologies, and um, it really is its own discipline. I think that's also something that people are surprised to find that they think it's kind of just an add-on or it's something that you know, lives in an IT department. But there, it is backed by a lot of research, and those of us who are professional educational technologists take that very seriously. So what do we do, those of us who are professional educational technologists? Um, sometimes we actually develop new tools. So you know, I, on my team, I actually have a couple of software developers who do write applications for teaching and learning. Often we provide just sort of consulting and support. We, we point people to applications that already exist, whether that's you know, how to teach statistics using uh, you know, things in Excel or using MATLAB for your, your engineering courses or things like that. Um, and we really just sort of sit down and we talk about pedagogical goals first with faculty rather than to try to, again, lead with the technology. That's really kind of not how we roll. Sometimes we help in producing videos for courses. That might be sort of custom video to explain uh, a principle. So we make sort of the equivalent of learning objects through short sort of video case studies or things like that. Sometimes we actually work on designing the classrooms in which instruction happens and figuring out the best design for a room, what kind of technology is needed in the room, what kind of flexibility would be needed in order to sort of optimize the type of teaching experience a faculty is trying to do. But overall, we just try to be you know, as flexible as possible so that we're able to support innovation you know, however it comes and no, no matter what sort of budget that we are, we're given to work with. Um, again, just a little bit of background on some of the folks in my team and other educational technologists at other universities. As I said, this is an actual sort of career. It's a, you know, it's, it's a, uh, a thing. Um, we, a lot of my staff are either PhDs or were ABDs, never quite finished that dissertation, but they became enamored of technology and they decided to kind of make this their career of helping other faculty with this. Some of them are people who have actually gone to say ed schools or have um, kind of you know, picked this path sort of directly. And others have been started with sort of as straight sort of computer science majors and have gotten into the field you know, from that. But mostly, they all have some kind of experience with teaching, and they, they love teaching, and they understand sort of the teaching process. So they are able to relate to our faculty. Um, I'm not going to go as far as to say as peers, as peers of Harvard faculty, but at least they, they're on the same page and can use sort of the same vocabulary about teaching and learning. 
Um, but as I said, we are this sort of interesting Venn diagram, you'll see what I mean sort of in, in a little while, that we're, we straddle this line between pedagogy and technology. And so sometimes, you know, the, the tech people think we're these sort of uh, touchy-feely, crunchy granola, you know, education people. And the education people think that we're the hardcore nerds. And I think the truth is that we're sort of somewhere in between. Okay. So with that background, let me dive into sort of the first kind of uh, case study or, you know, that I wanted to talk to you about, which is our new sort of co undergraduate core curriculum at Harvard. So for years, we actually had something called the core curriculum. And these were courses that Harvard students had to take. And they were typically very sort of faculty oriented. They were individual faculty who were holding forth on um, something that was related to their own research or something that they were very passionate about. But what we found from talking with the students is the, the result ended up being a very piecemeal experience. You know, they, they took stellar faculty you know, courses on this disparate range of topics, but they didn't really feel like it meshed into a particular curriculum. So after a couple of years of sort of some faculty workshopping, they came up with this new idea for a general education curriculum, which was going to try to do a better job of not only kind of give exposing students to the best thinking across all of Harvard's undergraduate departments, but also help try to prepare them for their lives after college. So for example, instead of just taking a course on Nietzsche, you know, taking a course maybe on ethics, where you know, Nietzsche and other authors are featured in this and so that you understand sort of how to apply some of the things that you are learning. We also wanted the general education curriculum to try to uh, encourage faculty to experiment with new ways of teaching. If you were to come to our campus and look around at our classrooms, you'd be, you might be surprised in that almost all of them are either sort of l big lecture halls or they're very small kind of seminar type rooms. We don't really have a lot of type spaces in between. And that's something that we're trying to kind of remedy. And we're trying to use the general education curriculum as a way to encourage new thinking um, about pedagogical experimentation. So, how did we do this? When we first started uh, the general education program, they had hired a new sort of associate dean named Stephanie Kennan to help us sort of, or help faculty sort of put this together. And to me, what she immediately found was that the faculty had gotten very comfortable to teaching in the core curriculum, and they were really kind of nervous about what this new gen ed curriculum meant. Like, what, what did they have to do? How did they, how do I make something sort of meaningful? And how do I experiment with pedagogy when I'm not even really sure you know, what, what's out there for me to do? So first, um, Dean Kennan kind of put together a sort of a, a call for, for help from all of us who do instructional support around Harvard College to say, so what, what could you do for this? Like, you know, raise your hand if you want to help. And then, so uh, several of us did sort of, uh, did volunteer to sort of help. And what we realized was though that instead of just giving faculty a list of all of us of like here you know you can help you can ask the library you can ask academic technology we wanted to sort of do better than that and so we kind of self-organized into something called the instructional support services team and so we have representatives in this working group from I said my team academic technology from our library from our teaching and learning center from our museums because we have museum educators we're fortunate to have several museums on campus uh, from our, uh, let's see, fr from our geographic information systems lab and others. And so we have this working group that will collaborate with faculty and help them design new courses or adapt old sort of core curriculum courses to try to think of new types of exercises and new types of teaching and learning strategies. What was challenging about sort of putting this together was when we first started doing this, uh, we, we kind of overwhelmed the faculty. Uh, we, we had sort of an, almost an embarrassment of riches at the table, and we would be sort of, uh, you know, all volunteering at once, and the poor faculty were kind of getting a little bit dazed with all of the options and really weren't sure what to do. So a big part of making this instructional support services team sort of functional was we had to do sort of some pre-work on our own. So we undertook a, a couple of weeks of actually pretty intensive team building to make sure that all of us on the team understood what the other parties did and that we would be committed to having a sort of a collective success and not really so much worried about what our individual group could do. 
So, um, and that really took a, a long time actually to, to really gel as a team and to sort of trust each other and to make sure that um, we, were, we would all give you know, good you know, sort of handoffs if, if a faculty member really seemed to be a better fit, say, for the library than for, for my team. In addition to the undergraduate programs, this started after a while, we, you know, I said we gelled as a team and it started working very well. So we started another sort of pilot project with the idea of teaching graduate students how to do the types of things that we were doing as an instructional support team. So we do have a pretty good program at Harvard for training our graduate students on how to become teachers once they finish their graduate program and they go off into academia on their own. So we initiated a program called the Graduate Seminars in General Education. And in these seminars, not only do the students learn you know, the, the subject matter, so you know, it might be Nietzsche, it might be uh, you know, uh, an engineering topic, could be anything, but we also spend about half the class teaching them what, we, th what our different groups do. So we teach them about uh, library resources, we teach them about academic technology, we teach them about teaching writing, all these kinds of things. And then the graduate students work with the faculty member on creating a curriculum for an undergraduate course to run the following semester. So the graduate students get some experience in designing an undergraduate course. And I don't expect you to be able to read all of this text, but I, again, just to sort of prove my Venn diagrammy point here, is this is um, the, the sort of the picture of what our instructional support team looks like, and that how we all work together, but again, the the center of the diagram is our faculty, so we need to make sure that we are starting with their pedagogical goals and not kind of imposing our individual, uh, you know, the individual things that we want to do. So it's like I'm not going to throw 3D at somebody who is just starting out. I want to listen to them about what are the goals for their class, and then you know, if I don't think that teaching with technology would be useful for them, I might pass them to the library or to the writing program or something like that. Okay, so a couple of examples of sort of what I mean about sort of how this worked. So this was a course of, uh, by a history professor named Dan Smale, who teaches a class on the Middle Ages. And again, this had been kind of a straight lecture class. You know, they were one-hour lectures three times a week. Students would do readings, have a paper, and then maybe a take-home paper or an exam at the end. What we did is we sort of worked as a team with Professor Smale to talk about, again, what were the goals and, uh, that he had. And he really wanted to kind of make the Middle Ages come alive for students. Um, he didn't even realize that we had some you know, items in the Harvard museums that people could use or in the, even the library collections. So we brainstormed with him. We helped him develop a new syllabus for this course. And we were able to design different exercises like taking the students through the museums to look at particular pieces and talk about them. The students were even able to curate a small museum exhibition based on you know, working with the museum educators and picking different pieces that were sort of in storage and be able to sort of write about them and uh, sort of teach uh, around, uh, around objects in the collection. Our library educators were able to come up with things that were in the collections that students were able to use, so you know, incunabula and various other uh, you know, things and things, and um, were able to take students kind of behind the scenes in the libraries because for many students the library begins and ends with sort of the stacks you know or maybe the online catalog and this is showing them how much more there really is to a library collection and then my team did things like we digitized various materials like an ancient scroll so that students could really you know uh, could um, look through the scroll and annotate it sort of on a big screen we made what was called sort of a course trailer to get people interested in taking this new gen ed course, meaning we made sort of like a movie trailer. And we have a whole series of these online that we've made. For the, these ended up being extremely popular for, uh, for promoting the general education curriculum. We made a series of little two to three minute movies to let the faculty member kind of explain what this new course was going to be about and to give the students kind of a feel for what they were really going to learn. Because otherwise, the only way a student was picking a course was from a two to three line description in our course catalog. So this has been something that was really um, a, you know, a popular sort of addition to our program. As an example of those graduate seminars in general education, um, we would, again, have an initial sort of meeting with the, the, the faculty member. And then we would work with um, the faculty on figuring out what they want the first the grad students to learn in this seminar 
and then what their hopes are for the undergraduate course that would follow along. So in this particular example, this was for a sociology course, and we made sure that the faculty member was even aware of some of these sort of data visualization tools that were out there. Now this would be somebody who would normally work with a very heavy duty, say, statistics package like Stata, but we sort of showed her things like, you know, Gapminder or, um, you know, Many Eyes for doing, you know, some simple, like, you know, Wordle type you know, sorts, OECD Explorer, things that were maybe a little bit more entry level and maybe a little bit more suitable, say, for the 18 year old who is just sort of coming into your discipline as opposed to the graduate students. Then we, uh, th my colleagues in the libraries um, helped the students learn about how to find different data sources. The, our colleagues in our teaching center taught the grad students you know, how you design a curriculum, how you design a syllabus, and how you lead discussion sections and encourage sort of shy people to speak up in a section and things like that. And then our writing program worked to teach them kind of uh, uh, some of the basics of teaching writing. How do you respond to student writing? You know, how do you give feedback and so on? And then the next semester, the graduate students ran the undergraduate class and then invited us back to sort of sit and listen uh, to sort of and help them uh, become better teachers while they taught the undergraduates. Okay. The next initiative I want to talk about is the Harvard Initiative on Learning and Teaching. And um, why this has been sort of such a landmark thing for us is, you know, Harvard is now 377 years old. And in 375 years, we actually had never had a pan-Harvard, meaning all of Harvard schools, kind of uh, organized discussion about pedagogy, about teaching. There had been conferences, say, about research, or there had been sort of efforts to help faculty in terms of their, their research. But not all of Harvard schools even have it, their own teaching and learning center. You know, we're fortunate that we do in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, but not all of the schools really do. So. One of our uh, very generous alums gave, a, gave us a donation with the goals of really kind of putting a focus on the teaching and learning enterprise at Harvard, thinking about new ways of doing things, and really try to get faculty to come out of their different sort of school silos and work across those silos and collaborate. Um, I have to say, when I first when I talked to one of our faculty and used the word silo, he uh, corrected me and said, at Harvard, we do not have silos. We have cylinders of excellence. So, um, and so I'm not really allowed to use the S word there. But and, and we want to get people to go across their excellent cylinders and talk to each other. So that was sort of a, a goal for this. So working sort of with our, our donors and with our teaching and learning center and our provost's office, we kind of put together the components for this program. And again, first off was to have an annual symposium where we're telling faculty we want them to talk about their teaching. And this might be surprising, but the, the, the classroom for, at many schools is kind of the, the chief domain or kingdom of an individual faculty member. Nobody else goes in there besides the students. Faculty are not necessarily observed on their teaching. And depending on where you are, they may not, it might not count towards their, their tenure reviews. So for one of the first things we wanted to do was kind of bust open those classroom doors and have people share about what works well, you know, what doesn't work so well, and, and to show their colleagues some innovative techniques that they might use in their teaching. The second part of this was to establish a grants program for faculty to allow them to do different types of experimentation. And these were not s solely technology-based grants. Uh, I think we only ended up with about half of the grants having some kind of technology component. But faculty could propose you know, any kind of idea. You know, they, they could have a grant where we would work with them to develop, say, you know, a series of learning objects for teaching math, which is one. But there was another one where um, a faculty member in, in arts and sciences wanted to have sort of a monthly lunch group for all the people who teach statistics in all of Harvard schools, including the business school and med school and public health and law, and get them together just to talk about approaches to teaching statistics, which had never been done before. But with a sort of, when you give people sort of a free lunch and, you know, you, you'll give them parking on our campus, which is much harder to do on our campus than it is here, um, they will actually come and do this. And so that's been one of the sort of, the, it seems like a low-hanging fruit type of thing, but just, again, telling them, you know, we want you to be talking about your teaching, we want you to be open and, and share with other people, and we're going to give you free lunch in order to do this has been a really successful thing. A third component of HILT has been to support those teaching and learning 
um, staff at the different schools. So as I, I, I talked, I started with talking about the instructional support team that we built for the gen ed curriculum. And what we're now trying to do based on the success of that program is set up something like that in each of Harvard's 11 schools and then also have sort of a meta group that we call the Teaching and Learning Consortium where those people can get together again on sort of a monthly basis to talk about what's going on in their schools, talk about resources they're developing, um, how ways of, of doing outreach to faculty and um, ways that we can sort of share what we're doing. So this has been in existence for about a year now and so we've, we've got some great collaborative projects going on about things like electronic portfolios and um, again we're doing a lot of work in uh, trying to bridge, bridge those, um, those cylinders on, on teaching of, of math and math related um, topics in the different schools you know, and so on. The fourth component of HILT has been to improve our sort of digital video infrastructure on campus. Um, our donor, Mr. Hauser, is the, uh, the genius behind pay-per-view, and so video is something that's very near and dear to his heart. So we are trying to make sure that we have a better sort of infrastructure for not only capturing digital video in our classrooms, but providing ways to do video conferencing to bring uh, you know, remote people into our classrooms. Um, we've been experimenting with sort of a global classroom concept for some of our larger courses, like the, uh, one of our Harvard X classes on, on justice, where we can have people around the world, multiple sites, who can um, ask questions or can sort of participate in a lecture setting. So that part is really just sort of going for infrastructure. And then finally, our deans are able to sort of make specific requests from HILT for school-wide projects. And to date, those have, for, have been for things like a new visualization center or some um, classrooms or sort of large scale you know, type of things. So, oh, decanal, that's Dean's Dean, Dean related. Sorry, fancy university word, yes. <laughs> yep. They're, they're starting to. It's still, it's kind of in the early stages, but I mean, I think this has been just a really positive thing because that's what we hear from faculty is through, through Hilt and through Gen Ed, it's sort of like, oh, we're, we're, we're allowed to talk about our teaching? It, it was almost, they almost sort of thought that they shouldn't do that. So we're kind of giving them permission to have these conversations now. So as I said, we have now an annual sort of symposium. Again, it was first time in, uh, when we first did this, it was first time in 375 years that we got faculty talking about what they're doing and showing what they do to the other faculty. And um, this has been great. We have another one sort of coming up in May, our, our second annual one. We have speakers from both inside Harvard and you know, experts from, from other universities as well. And then those of us in that teaching and learning consortium set up sort of a resource fair, kind of a little trade showy type thing, where we could sort of have a little booth to show people what we do. Show them library resources or museum resources or ed tech demos or things like that. So if they hadn't worked with us before and hadn't met us, then they could um, at least sort of get to know us and, and um, know that uh, we were eager to work with them. I mentioned a little bit about the grants. So some of the, they've been from everything from, you know, buying lunch for people or helping with um, a research study. We, we, there was one that we, the results of which were just published last week that we gave uh, some, a faculty member some money to be able to do some research into the effects of online learning on student engagement and um, Professor Dan Schachter just published a paper looking at interspersing um, online lectures with quizzes resulting in better student performance so that all that research was funded via HILT. Uh, we have, I think, 41 grants out this year that will be, um, they'll be finishing up by the end of June, so we'll be reporting on that first year of grants uh, so far. And on the, there is a HILT website, I can, you know, pass these slides around um, afterwards that you can take a look at all the different things that we're funding. And I mentioned a bit about the, the TLC, or our Teaching and Learning Consortium. So it's taking members from all 11 of Harvard schools who do instructional support and making sure that they know who, you know, who each other are and that they can uh, share information and, um, and you know, help each other out. Okay, so let me go into uh, talking a bit about edX, which is kind of consuming my life these days. So as I said, my, I like to say that my day job is as Director of Academic Technology for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, but really since um, last fall, uh, Harvard X has been my uh, uh, 
about 120% of my time and uh, we're, as we're bootstrapping this particular project. So what I want to make sure that is everyone is very clear about is in there, there's edX, but then there's also HarvardX, MITx, and there's an X for all the different sort of partner universities here. So edX is a nonprofit that is co-owned by Harvard and MIT. And the way it sort of came into being was through a couple different sort of streams that happened to kind of converge around the same time. So one, you know, I had mentioned earlier about the general education curriculum and Harvard kind of waking up a little bit to paying more attention about teaching and learning sort of on our campus. Then again, as Harvard turned 375 years old, the deans had a committee, the deans of all 11 of Harvard schools sort of had a committee called Harvard at 400, which was meant to sort of look at, you know, where are we going to be in 25 years? What's our roadmap? What are the changes we want to see happening over the next 25 years? There were also, at the same time, some independent faculty initiatives in the space of online learning. You know, we had faculty who were being wooed by University of Phoenix to do some you know, either guest lecturing or guest teaching there. We had some working on student-led projects, like something called Finals Club for uh, putting lectures online to help students study. We had some faculty who were even interested in founding their own online universities. And the deans were starting to get a little worried that some of Harvard's content was being perhaps frittered away or sort of scattered because there wasn't really a set Harvard policy in place um, or initiative where they could do this. At the same time, you know, we got a new CIO um, at Harvard, Anne Margulies, and um, I had worked with Anne. So before I came to Harvard, I was at MIT for 15 years working in academic technology, and then I worked on um, the beginnings of the OpenCourseWare project. And Anne was also the executive director of MIT OpenCourseWare. So one, you know, Anne is very much of the sort of open knowledge, uh, she's very much an open knowledge sort of evangelist, and what um, we realized, you know, at, at Harvard was that Harvard kind of felt a little bit bad about missing some of that open knowledge bandwagon in years past. So we, you know, Harvard had never contributed to open courseware, had never sort of had any kind of collective um, open educational resource initiative. Even though we sort of had pockets here and there, uh, we really didn't have kind of a coordinated way of doing this. So, and so we, but then suddenly around this time that we were thinking about these other things, um, our deans realized that, you know, through Anne and to a lesser extent me, we had people with experience in providing uh, you know, open resources to the world. And so, as I said, w with this new focus on teaching and learning, there also got to be this desire by the deans and the provost and the president to say, you know what, we really should be doing something. Of all the universities in the world, you know, we are th probably the best place to be able to give back and, and give some of our materials. And so through these different sort of streams kind of started converging and we sort of came up with this idea of partnering with MIT to launch this new organization that we was ended up being called edX. So edX has a governing board that's primarily made up of leadership from MIT and Harvard. Um, but it is its own sort of independent nonprofit. It's in Kendall Square right near MIT, but it's separate you know, from that. There's also an edX sort of consortium of universities. So there are schools that partner with edX on releasing course materials through the edX platform. And right now uh, there are 12 of those universities. Uh, that number is ever changing and will likely be growing, but right now it's at 12. Speaking of ever-changing, the edX platform is continually evolving. This is something that's being custom-built with the idea of being an open platform. They're very committed to this being an open source endeavor so that, again, so we can, people can publish things freely and will be able to ad adopt, if they choose, the edX platform and use this sort of from their own campuses. I don't know if you saw in the news this week, we've just announced that we are actually going to be merging the code base from edX with Stanford's Class2Go platform, which we're really excited about because Class2Go has some really interesting features that we're missing sort of in edX. And so we're really looking forward to, uh, to working on that and hope to have some of that work done um, by June 1st, uh, which is also when we want to try to do our first uh, release, uh, open source release of the platform. So. That's kind of edX as sort of a central, you know, platform or a publishing sort of organization. In addition to sort of that, the central edX group, each of those consortium schools has its own, you know, sort of dash X local support team. 
There's also sort of a liaison from the edX group that works with the local teams, but the course production actually happens sort of on our own campus. So here's where I would say, so Harvard's goal, I mean, I showed you kind of the streams that led into thinking about you know, why we wanted to sort of get into the open educational resource you know, arena in the first place. And you'll notice that up until now, I haven't had anything up on the screen that had the MOOC acronym on it. And that's very purposeful in that for Harvard and for Harvard X, we really don't see what we're doing as being a MOOC initiative. The, the MOOCiness or the massive open online is part of it, <laughs> but it's not the be all and end all and it's not sort of why we wanted to do this. You know, we really wanted to find out what really works in the arena of online education. We wanted to make sure that, you know, if you will, that the, the, the emperor actually did have new clothes or that there was a there there. We wanted to know what this was about and, you know, what could this tell us about improving teaching and learning on our campuses. Since we already had the new gen ed curriculum, we already had the HILT projects going, we wanted to, this to be sort of yet another component in our uh, you know, looking into pedagogy and improving pedagogy in all its forms. What I, the way I like to kind of describe how we're thinking about this is if you can imagine that there are sort of three sort of tiers or three buckets of education that we have at Harvard. So on one hand, we have our residential, our traditional residential experience. Students come, they live there, they go to school, they spend a couple of years either as an undergraduate or a graduate student. Harvard also has kind of a middle tier that I would call sort of extended education. We have the Harvard Extension School through the Division of Continuing Education. We have professional, you know, short-term professional programs, certificate programs, things where you, you, you might be on campus but not to the same extent as a residential person, um, or you might be doing a blended learning course sort of through the extension school. This third tier is the one that's kind of new for us, and that's our sort of open education. And that's where, again, we'd had pockets, but we really hadn't had a coordinated effort about this before. So what we see Harvard X as being as, on the one hand, being sort of our open segment of that, um, of that sort of market, but we also want to make sure that we are taking what we learn from that and feeding the other two tiers as well so that all of these things are learning from each other. Our residential is learning from our open, which is learning from our extended, and that we have a nice you know, kind of positive feedback loop so that we're able to provide excellent education in all of those different realms. So what we're doing now with Harvard X is to try to you know, sort of start populating kind of that open column of things and work with faculty on who, who are interested in translating their on-campus teaching into one of these sort of open and online courses. And in fact, when we do this, not all of our faculty decide that they end up wanting to actually do a MOOC or to do um, you know, something online. So some of them, after we sort of go over the goals with them, decide, you know what, they'd rather try something that's more blended or they want to work with the extension school or they want to just try something in their on-campus teaching. But we have had some brave souls who have wanted to sort of jump into this. And um, you know, if you do know anything about Harvard, we tend not to be a very risky place. So sometimes uh, we, we kind of uh, scratch our heads and kind of marvel at the fact that we've gotten this far into um, this enterprise right now, because it is a fairly risky behavior, or ris a risky endeavor. Uh, but it is something that we want to learn from to see, again, if there is, if there is a there there um, about MOOCs. So, how do we do this? Um, so within our Harvard X team, we have, right now we're all, almost all kind of part-timers pulled from other parts of the university, um, largely from that same group that comprised the uh, Teaching and Learning Consortium that I showed earlier. So we have uh, our leadership coming from the Academic Technology and our Box Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, with help again from our library. We have two oversight committees which are faculty-based committees. So we have a course committee that works on figuring out which of our courses at Harvard we want to offer. And we're trying to make sure that they are a very diverse range of offerings from all of Harvard schools, that they're not just based on the undergraduate curriculum or only based on you know, one particular school. We also have a research committee. As I said, we are, uh, we're certain that we want research to be a sort of an underlying principle about why we are doing this. We want to know what really works. We want to know what we can take back to our on-campus teaching and what we can share with the world from best practices here. 
and we want to be honest about things that work and about things that might not work you know as well so we can we have two faculty committees who govern sort of what we do here so we just started publishing our courses October 15th we have five that have uh, been going since then we'll have one more spring class that is launching next month um, we've had uh, over 300,000 people take our courses so far and uh, we are you know, expecting you know, a lot more you know, coming sort of in the future. We, are, we, have one, we have 10 classes, give or take, planned for this coming fall, uh, including one called Science and Cooking, which is one of our, the general education classes we put together, where again, it was the, the idea was to make a, a science class relevant to your life after college. So this is a class that looks at scientific principles, so you can learn about emulsions and all sorts of things while cooking things as well. Um, this has also been a very fun one to transform into a MOOC because um, I, I find myself answering questions for the faculty of like, can you find ricotta cheese in Namibia? Can you get pH testing strips in Bangalore? You know, so those are types of things that we're, we're trying to take something that we do as an on-campus course and think about how would we do this, um, you know, sort of around the world with, with students in different countries and who have different um, kitchen equipment, shall we say, and other things. So. Um, our, our purpose so far in, in these particular courses, again, is to, be, to give a variety of things, to show people kind of a variety of, of, uh, of disciplines you know, at Harvard, and um, hopefully make them things that are going to be relevant to people's you know, lives sort of around the world. So we really do take sort of the, the production quality quite seriously. We have a very talented video staff who works with faculty. Um, but as I said earlier, we always start off with what are their sort of learning goals. So I have kind of outlined kind of the steps that we go through when we are designing one of these courses. The very first thing we do is kind of talk to faculty about sort of why they want to do this and how they want to do this. So what are their goals? At the end of the course, what do they want the students to come away with? And then we kind of help them, again, craft sort of a syllabus or translate if they're on campus syllabus to something that's going to work in this format. We work with them on what we call sort of the teaching performance aspect. So uh, that's, we have experts in our teaching and learning center on sort of capturing teaching and um, performance and coaching them on public speaking or how to engage with students. But instead of having a live audience, these have to be sort of pre-recorded. So we try to sort of walk them through how do you do this and how do you get comfortable with the camera. Um, we've had some funny exchanges with some of our faculty who are, can be quite camera shy of, of sort of bringing them out of their shell and because you know, nobody wants to you know, watch an instructional video that looks like it, it's a hostage video or something like that. So we do try what we can to kind of make them a little bit more you know, comfortable with what's going on. Um, where we, we've become painfully aware of how much we rely on the TEACH Act in order in terms of copyright and fair use on our own campus. So we've been working very closely with our Office of General Counsel on a procedure sort of for vetting copyright for things that we are putting out there you know, in our courses and developing a handbook for faculty explaining what they can and cannot do. We work with faculty on new technology tools that they might need in order to teach at this sort of massive scale. So for example, our class on the ancient Greek hero relies on teaching students close reading of the text and how to do text analysis. And our faculty really wanted to try to simulate that, but for, in this case, I think 50,000 students. So my team actually put together a collaborative annotation tool that would allow students to sort of look at a text and highlight different portions, talk about them, and engage with discussions with others um, about a particular text. So it's simulating a close reading exercise. Yep, Michael. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So yeah, so we, you can't use the TEACH Act for in this case, basically. So as I said, we've been used to using the TEACH Act on our on-campus. And so now, I mean, we have faculty who have, you know, thousands of slides and things like that that they use in their lecture. And now they're not happy when we tell them that they have to go back and get citations for each one or get permissions. And so that's a big part of what we're doing kind of behind the scenes is coming up with you know, workflow of how do we go and ask for permission for these things or how do we figure out like what can we cover as sort of fair use that if it's, is it, if, it, if it's used in sort of a transformative way within a lecture and it's cited 
our lawyers are comfortable with calling that fair use. But if it's just sort of put on a website or distributed, those are the things for which we need to secure permission from publishers. So that's roughly sort of how we are splitting those up. We're finding some publishers are more than willing to work with us. So for one of the first edX courses, they got an agreement from a publisher to put up individual pages, or I think they even, I don't know if they did PDFs of, of pages of the textbook. And the publisher was really quite nervous about it. But it turned out that you know 40,000 people wanted to buy the textbook anyway. And the textbook quickly went out of print. And the publisher, and this was Elsevier, by the way, and they said, what else can we give you that you can you know, put online? So some publishers are finding it really actually boosts their sales to kind of play with us. And there are others who still don't want to. So there are some, especially some other university presses, they're like, nope, you have no permission to use this whatsoever. And that has actually changed. We've had to alter some of the uh, courses that we were planning to release if they were really uh, wanting to use a particular publication. Yeah. Right. Yep. <laughs> it is. And um, we actually have been partnering with our friends over at MIT OpenCourseWare because they have a really nice sort of tool that they've developed to help keep track of you know, what's already out there that's Creative Commons, what can, what can we commission a new work? So if we can't get permission to use a map, maybe we can redraw the map or we can send someone to take a new photo if they don't let us use the photo that's in the textbook or things like that. So it is, it is. And, and, and it also, I mean, I, I would say it does sometimes influence some of what courses we're able to release. You know, we, we had a, a course that was really wanting to go for fall, but they were bound to determine they wanted to use one particular textbook from a publisher, and that publisher abjectly refuses to have it, despite all evidence that it would actually probably increase their sales, but they won't, they won't do it. Yep. I'm hoping in a couple years those folks will come around because they'll see that, I mean, we really, literally for every other book that's been used in one of the edX courses right now that has seen an increase in sales from this because people still do want that to hold the book. Yeah. We haven't looked at that yet, but we have, we, we've gotten some uh, publishers to agree to let us use things like, say, a chapter if there are, you know, convenient but not obnoxious links within of where you go to buy the book, you know, sort of an Amazon link or if you, you know, that they'll let us re, you know, use a chapter for a part of a class, but then provide a link where they can purchase the full book or something like that. But we haven't quite, quite got to the pay-per-view yet, but that's probably coming. Yeah, that's what we wanted to say. I mean, we didn't want it, you know. No, th we don't want a big, big blinky thing that comes in, you know, that buy this now. But, um, you know, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah. Nope, nope. So these are completely free right now. We are looking in the future to see, that, so whether we would need to charge some kind of a fee, say, to if you want to get a certificate to of completion. And the certificate thing is actually um, is something else we're, we're still figuring out what this means. So right now, you know, you can, you take the course and you complete whatever the faculty member thinks you need to have completed in order to sort of pass the course. And that might mean that you do a certain amount of the online exercises or that you contribute so much to the discussion forums or you turn in, you know, a certain amount of that, of, of, the, of the work. And um, we have some really interesting conversations going on in our faculty sort of course committee about then, so what does that mean? It, do you get, is it a certificate of mastery? Is it just a certificate of participation? Is it of completion? And should we have multiple types of certificates? Or should there be some kind of hybrid model where if you take the MOOC version, the free version of the course, you get a certificate of completion. Should we in the future then tie that into say our extension school where if you could do extra work and turn things in and have more you know, individualized feedback from a teaching assistant, then maybe you get credit via our extension school. So these are all, you know, this is still very early and we're still figuring out what this is all going to mean. Yep. So, right, and um, that's also, th this is a tricky one to answer in that, I mean, the, the, I would say probably 10% actually sort of finish, but what we don't yet know is, did they actually plan to finish the course? 
and, and that's sort of an average. We had a bit higher in the computer science class. I think that was closer to sort of to 20 percent um, on that one. The computer science class also was open for six months as opposed to three months to try to be you know, sort of better for working professionals. However, the only way for you to even go in and look at these courses is to register. So we know that the registration numbers sort of get in inflated because you have to register. Even if you want to kind of just be a looky-loo, you have to sort of register. So something we're trying to do for fall is to get better kind of pre-registration data of, of asking people, like, do you really want to do the work? Are you here just to kind of look? Uh, uh, we're noticing especially, I mean, in, I think Coursera has this issue as well, um, that people often register for courses, but they kind of think it's going to be just like watching some YouTube videos, that they don't actually have to do anything. Like, they can be very passive. And that's not what these are about. These are actual, you know, Harvard courses where you actually have to work, you have to post in the discussion forums, you have to do the assignments. And so sometimes people are like, oh, no, that, this is more than I really wanted. I just kind of want to click and watch the lectures and not actually do anything beyond that. So, yeah. Right. Um, well, I said we, we do have some of that expertise locally in our teaching and learning center when I was talking about kind of the teaching performance, you know, piece of it. But again, these are, uh, and, and we have our Harvard Extension School who have expertise in sort of the blended model. But um, our course, the, the courses that we are teaching I in sort of the MOOC model don't have the same number of, say, teaching assistants and individualized, you know, feedback for students. So they're trying to kind of optimize and, and do as much as they can for, for large numbers of people, which is, again, why we're kind of trying to think about the, um, you know, what does our extension school do versus what are the f sort of the free things that we are doing, you know, in, in this area. So, um, actually, let me just go back real quick to uh, where I said the communications planning and that pre-registration data. This is something that we've actually found a really useful uh, tool in figuring out sort of how the course should go in that we are able to, it, through a better sort of pre-registration process, we're going to be better able to find out who are kind of, again, the, the looky-loos, who and, and why people are taking the course, and also where they're from. And that has really made a big impact. Like, we, we discovered a lot of people were trying to take our course on justice from Brazil, so we made a very quick last di um, effort to try to translate the materials sort of into Portuguese. Or if we have a, a large number of people in China, we've realized we have to find different ways of getting the video to them because we currently rely on YouTube for that, and that wasn't going to work. So yeah, What's the model? Are you using your, your value? You step back and mm -hmm. grand your journey. I mean, it's open courseware for people with gateway drugs and knowledge. Yeah, so yeah. Or are you planning on, or, or, I, I know that this is as far from the academic mind as somebody could think, but I mean, are you thinking of perhaps monetizing the fact that you've got 300,000 people who raise their hands because I'm interested in the tech? I mean, so like, so like, I mean, could you actually Right, right. Right. I mean, I think there's a variety of them, and I think if you asked around our different schools at Harvard, and if you even asked some of the different edX consortium schools, they'd all sort of want something different. Um, some of Harvard schools are thinking like, oh, great, I can do a MOOC class, and that's going to draw more people to my professional education program. There are some who, we, we have some faculty who are nearing retirement and, you know, they, they've so far only been able to teach, say, you know, 200 people at a time in their course and it's something they're really passionate about and they kind of see this as their legacy. Like, they feel like they've spent their whole careers perfecting a course on something and they would like to sort of to share that, you know, with the world. Um, there are others who just, who really want to uh, focus on, say, uh, increasing knowledge in the developing world and giving people access to something that they, you know, had never, you know, had an opportunity to do. So, you know, I, I think we're primarily altruistic, but we also realize that despite being, you know, a, a relatively w wealthy university, um, we can't keep funding this without some kind of you know, sustainability. Well, and this... Well, 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 I mean, mm -hmm. It's a multi-channel e-commerce model. Right. Mm-hmm. And they're looking at how that works. Because you really are, forgive me for it, like, mm -hmm. trivializing, like, you know, <laughs> 
like like that in the prior yeah, education. Like, 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 right, like, yeah, yeah. But like, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you do have that, that opportunity to right. like, do something like that. Right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Like state schools who have no money. <laughs> right. You know, like, Right. And, and, and we are actually having a couple experiments going right now with uh, some community colleges and some state schools who are using the materials we're creating uh, so that they, it, in, on an in-class setting. So like San Jose State is using this, uh, uh, Bunker Hill Community College and Mass Bay Community College are experimenting with some of our curricula that, uh, through edX. And then, it, but it, that's not supplanting the local professor. And I think that's sort of a, a uh, misconception that many people have about these courses because I, mean, I think some people get all excited and say well why you know why would you teach you know physics on your own campus when you could have Richard Feynman teaching your students physics well you could have somebody sort of lecturing to them but you then you, you still have to have sort of the local support for the student and the individualized learning and, and things like that so um, a lot of I know a lot of faculty can be very nervous you know around the country that this is aiming to sort of shove them out of a job, but I think if anything, it's 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 quite the latter. It's that you know then they get to have some of their time freed up to really work with the students who are in the room with them and provide them with the sort of the individualized support that they're going to need. So, yeah, Marilyn, sure. If I knew about the financial models, I could, but I don't, because that's a, that's happening at that leader at the leadership model, and I'm more focused on the course development part. Right. So they're, I mean, they're, they're following the, the curriculum. So for, I mean, the, the, for the computer science curriculum, there is a local faculty member sort of at Bunker Hill or at uh, Mass Bay. And they are, you know, sort of going, having the students go through the curriculum sort of on their own in, in a flipped classroom approach where the students sort of watch videos sort of as homework. But then when they come to class, they work through the problem sets or the coding assignments together in the room where then if they're having problems, the faculty member is right there in front of them or their peers can help them with the project. So if you're, if you're not familiar with that term, that's a kind of all the rage in education now is this idea of a flipped classroom where you get students doing, you know, sort of the, the more maybe passive things sort of on their own individually, but for things where they really might need more support and more interaction, you do that actually in the classroom instead. So that's kind of the gist of that, and we're actually going to be expanding that soon for some um, community-based education in Boston. So for, again, for some of the technology, you know, related things, it's for uh, community centers and so on. So, yeah. Um, no, I, I, mean, I think it does because I think they still would have to go through the whole, you know, the plan, the syllabus, and if anything, that, that means that they have more individualized help from the on-campus, you know, person who's there. So that, you know, on their own in the evenings or whenever, they're watching the videos or maybe they're doing sort of the try it exercises, but then they come to class and maybe they work in teams at a, at a table to work on the coding assignment and they have teaching fellows who are walking around and, and helping them at that time. Oh. <laughs> um, that still remains to be seen. I think, I mean, because we, we've had a uh, incident with one of our classes where a faculty member was, you know, he, he, he noticed that sort of some of the participation was dropping off and uh, he thought like, oh, well, or don't worry, everybody, you'll, you'll still get a certificate, you know, even, you know, if you don't finish everything. And then we kind of had to sort of slap our heads like, well, that's not what we said we were going to do. 
Um, so this is an item that we're talking a lot about sort of in our faculty um, you know, governance committee of you know, what does this mean exactly? And we, we want to try to come up with, you know, what the, I mean, I think edX would like to have sort of a standard, but you know, we were, we're 12 different schools with very different um, you know, ideas here. So I think that there is going to end up being you know, a range of different options. Yeah. Nope. No, these are all separate. As I said, these are all sort of you know, the, the, the teaching performance, sort of in either in a studio or, I mean, that's what's kind of fun about it is we're able to also do some things that are on site. So I'm working, you know, with a, um, a, a class on statistics and we're actually doing a little bit of filming like in a, you know, in a casino for a portion to explain sort of odds or we have a class on um, Puritan poetry and we're filming in some different sites around Harvard Square where some of these, you know, poets had lived. Again, to try to make it very high quality and very engaging and not just be a standard talking head lecture video. So, yeah. Okay. No. So, and, and this is sort of, again, w a part of what, you know, well, all the things on the screen right now are kind of the things that are in my, ruling my world these days. But that second to last bullet is, is a big part of this, is figuring out the, what we'll call sort of the deployment of this, of what are the things that people need to think about, not only in terms of the development before it launches, but then how do you sort of operate a course sort of in this way of what are, how many, uh, you know, teaching fellows do you need to be interacting with students? What are these criteria for completion? What, what are sort of special events that you could do to keep people's enthusiasm, to keep them from dropping out? So for our justice course, um, Professor Sandel has been having some sort of you know, live feeds and we try to time these at different times of day to, to reach people in different time zones around the world where they can individually ask questions you know, of Professor Sandel. For our copyright course, we have a sort of a series of people coming to, to the Harvard Law School and then we are live streaming those events as well. I would also add, so with the copyright class, when we were doing the sort of course deployment planning of how would you teach, you know, sort of a law class to a couple, you know, hundred, or, you know, to tens of thousands of people, we kind of got to a point in the conversation and Professor Fisher sort of said, you know what, I don't think I can do it for something this big. This course really relies on a lot of individual attention for the students. And so we, we ended up for this one is, uh, it, it, we capped it at 500 people and we had a lottery for it. So instead of it being a massive open online course, it's a small private online course, or it's instead of a MOOC, it's a Spock. So, um, and, and so that, but you can't sort of figure this out until you kind of go through all these different steps of what are we really trying to do here? And if a faculty member thinks that, you know what, this is not going to be conducive to that MOOC model, that's fine. And so that's, we have room within Harvard X for things like that. Right. So th that, you know, a lot of that takes place through the discussion forums. And um, I, I know and at first you sort of think like, oh, that's going to be overwhelming when there's tens of thousands of people. But what you find is that generally uh, there's a, there's just, a lot of people have the same questions. And, you know, somebody asks the question, the discussion forum tool lets people kind of upvote questions like, oh, I had that question too. And it tends to work out and people also help each other as well. So we find that uh, some folks, uh, some students in the course end up being almost community moderators and we're also working at ways of trying to give them some kind of uh, either, you know, compensation or extra credit or something like that for being, for, for taking on sort of roles like that. Who are now actively involved in the course. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Right. And, and that's where, so for, to take our, our CS50 class that's going on right now, that has 150,000 students in that one alone. The faculty member has uh, created a lot of sort of auto grading exercises so that you can figure out you know, very easily if your, your code compiles. He also, though, um, was able to get some support for his department to have additional teaching fellows who will lead sort of discussion sections and have smaller groups of people who can meet weekly to, again, get some of that individual attention. Um, and but again, it's sort of at the end of it, you do get a certificate. You don't get sort of any kind of credit. But he is sort of actively thinking of like, well, then if I have an extension school version of this class and I can charge for this class, then I can have even more sort of teaching staff who will be able to work more closely with individual students to sort of give them that individual feedback. This gets trickier for, right, for humanities and social science courses. Um, one of the things that edX is experimenting with are AI models to say like, can we do auto grading of short answers or essays or things like that? And that's really, you know, it's tricky. I mean, we're, we're looking forward to seeing what sort of the research on that happen, or what, what happens out of that research. I would say it's sort of the, the, the AI or the auto grading of essays is not a key thing for Harvard X right now, but we're going to be sort of following it closely to see what we're able to, to learn from that. But it is, I mean, it's uh, it, the, the single factor I think that's going to um, decide whether this is successful or not is how much sort of individualization or personalization for the learner are we going to be able to do and, and to encourage them not to drop out of the course and to encourage them to kind of to press on sort of for that certificate. And it's still early and so we're going to continue to experiment to see what we can take away from this and, and again what we can s bring to um, our best practices and learning on campus as well. Let me, I know I'm probably over time already, but let me sort of quickly kind of tell you what's happening next is we're now kind of staffing up. So we actually have, we're, we're becoming a full Harvard X organization. So um, we're going to have full-time people. So doing, you know, what I do, what our videography staff do. We're always enhancing our research agenda to see, you know, like, what are the things that we want to learn as new schools come on board, as we're doing new projects, say, again, with the city of Boston um, and other community colleges. Um, we're really working on kind of our workflow and how we train faculty and our course producer sort of staff on, on how to do this. And some of our courses want to do this again. Our computer science professor already wants to do this again. The ancient Greek hero faculty wants to do it again. And so now we have to figure out, like, what did we learn from the first time and, and what could we, we do? So just again to, to kind of wrap up of the, the three different projects I talked about, um, the themes here, and I think why we've been able to kind of do this, is uh, over time we are learning as how to be more like one Harvard. We're, we're a very disparate organization. As I said, we have 11 schools who all have some of their own, um, you know, agendas and have staff who do some similar things. What we really had to learn to do is how to work together a bit better and appreciate what everybody brings to the table. So understanding more what you know, the libraries and teaching centers and IT and, and, and you know, what those businesses are and that we are not um, competing with each other. We all have this goal of supporting instruction and that we should be aiming for sort of a, a collective success and that um, we need to be making sure that we're putting sort of the faculty at the center of what we're doing. So those of you who are not sure from universities might say that you know, the business need is what should be driving it, not that you're just bringing in a particular you know, technology. And as long as you're leading with what your business need is or what your teaching needs you know, are, and you're willing to kind of reach out across your comfort zone and, and collaborate with other people, um, I think those are the things that have been making us successful so far. So anyway, so I'll be here the rest of the day, so I'm happy to talk with people more, but I know I need to leave time for my friend Michael to talk to you too. So...